Australia. Welcome again to our Wednesday night Bible study. And I want to continue this week to look at the light of nature and how uh, the light of nature, as we understood last week, is how we can see things from the world around us, from how we understand the world around us. Um, we, we can see God's goodness to us and we can see that there is a God and that we are to, to look to nature for many things and you know there's an awful lot uh, that we learn from nature that isn't in the bible so for example the bible doesn't tell us how to make antibiotics uh, it doesn't tell us how to find oil to make petrol and diesel with uh, the bible doesn't tell us how to do open heart surgery now <laughs> you might say well why didn't god put these things in the bible well they're not important for salvation they're very important for life uh, we only discovered antibiotics relatively recently in human history we only have discovered how to, to make internal combustion engines and travel the way we have. And even things like the printing press uh, are relatively recent discoveries and inventions. And the Bible doesn't tell us how to do any of these things, which gives us a clue uh, as to what the Bible is for. It's not there for improving our lives. If it, if it was, it would give us recipes for antibiotics and how to do uh, brain surgery and how to make engines and stuff like that no it is there solely to point us to the lord jesus christ and the rest we learn in the light of nature but you know the light of nature can help us in areas where the bible doesn't have anything to say so for example the bible doesn't tell us what time on a sunday to worship god it doesn't say what particular time we should come together it doesn't say how long a service of worship should be and those are things that we're to judge for ourselves in the light of nature, using our common sense from what we can see around us. And that can be different in different countries. Uh, I remember being in Kenya, and people in Kenya actually asked me, because they didn't believe it, they said, is it true in Ireland that it gets dark and bright at different times throughout the year? Because they are so close to the equator, uh, sunrise and sunset are the same all the year round. And they thought it was amazing that uh, the sun rose and set at different times that changed so that's going to change how you do things in kenya in church and as well as that like obviously it's a lot warmer there so they don't have to worry about heating in church the way we do so there's an awful lot that we do in church like putting on the heat and when we put it on uh, whether we have pews or chairs or what way the sound is and stuff like that that the bible gives us no instruction for but to figure it out ourselves using wisdom and common sense and we see this in the Bible. Now, I'm going to read from Corinthians chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. So we're going to pause your video there and get out 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. So looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13, I'm going to read on to 14, 15 and 16. Now, let me say something before I start. I am not teaching about head coverings and about what women or men are to wear or not to wear in church that's not, not not the point that's a whole other bible study there is one sentence that i want to pull out from these verses that teach us as a principle from the bible about how we're to use our perception of the world around us and how we see nature so we read in first corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13 the apostle paul says this to the church in corinth judge for yourselves is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does even nature itself not teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her as a covering. But if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor have the churches of God. Now again, the whole thing about length of hair and all that so for example if you're going to say how long can a man's hair be before it's a dishonor to him it doesn't say it doesn't say but the whole point of these verses is the distinction between men and women that men and women are, are different they're not the same and that naturally there is a difference between the two and that's what paul is pointing to now how people understand that in in their time how they understand nature is maybe different to how we understand nature we've learned a lot more about nature since but the principle is still there that a, a man is not to be like a woman a woman is not to be like a man they're different they're two different types of human being male and female god made them and that's 
the appeal to nature that, that Paul makes. Does even nature itself not teach you? So here's an important thing. Paul isn't appealing to scripture here. He's appealing to nature. He's saying, does even nature itself not teach you? You know, you could say the same thing about the Ten Commandments. You could say, thou shalt not steal. And you could say, does nature not itself even not teach you that this is wrong? In other words, without ever having read the Ten Commandments, you would naturally know it's not right. Or you could say that um, a man and woman have to be faithful to each other in, in, in marriage for the sake of the family and, 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 and for the sake of the household. Does not even nature itself teach you this? So again, people who've never opened the Bible know that this is a good thing and that it's not a good thing if one partner having promised faithfulness is not faithful. Again, you know, the scripture says, do not bear false witness against your neighbour. But you could say, does even nature itself not teach you this? That someone who has never read the Bible or the Ten Commandments, if someone tells them a lie, they just naturally feel that that's wrong. So, you know, how to get your head around this principle is, you know, if you're thinking about something in the Bible and you're reading about it, say to yourself, does even nature itself not teach me this? You know, it's, it's, it's more than just something that's in the Bible. It's something that is in the fabric of our being as well. Because you see, Paul in Corinth was coming to a church that was crazy. <laughs> Some people have this notion that they would like to go back in time to the way the church was in the time of the apostles. That if only we could make the church the way it was in the book of Acts and in how we read about the church in Paul's letters. In other words, if we could be like the first generations of Christians, the church would be pure and perfect. Well, believe me, the church was a disaster in the first century. It was, it was, you do not want to be like the church as it's described in the New Testament. As it was, it was chaotic. There was crazy stuff going on. In the church in Corinth, for example, we know from reading elsewhere in, the, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In, in, imagine this. Do you want your congregations to be like this? In the church in Corinth, there was a man having a, an affair with his stepmother. And that was allowed to go on. And it was no one. Some people thought it was bad. Some people thought it was okay. You know, do you want a church like that? Uh, in the church in Corinth, they baptized people on behalf of their dead relatives. They did this. And, you know, there was so much else wrong that Paul just passed over that. He just kind of maybe thought to himself, I'll deal with that again. The, the, the first century church was chaotic and crazy. There, there was crazy stuff going on in it morally and when it came to their understanding of worship. They're not meant as a model to us. In fact, what's meant to a model to what's meant as a model to us is the apostles correcting the church in the fourth century what are wrong so you want to be the church wants to be the way that the word of god says we should be but we don't look at descriptions of the first century church and want to be like them so for example if, if, if you pause again and look at first corinthians chapter 14 first corinthians chapter 14 pause and open that up so in first corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26 Paul says to the church in Corinth, what is the outcome then, brothers and sisters? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. All things are to be done for edification. Now, some people have mistakenly believed that this is an instruction of how church should be. That each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. No, Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, you are chaotic. You know, you should be doing things for edification, not in this crazy, disorganized way. Um, and we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 again. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Pause there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Here's the context. Here is like the headline under which Paul is talking to them about their worship. He says to them, Now, in giving this next instruction, I do not praise you. Because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. So Paul is writing the letter of 1 Corinthians in large part to say to them, Look, you are doing church all wrong. And I don't praise you for how you do church. Not just the Lord's Supper, but the rest of the stuff that he talks about. Because he's correcting them about all kinds of things. And he says, when you're coming together, it's not for the better. People are not getting edified. 
It, they're, they're going out maybe worse than they came out. Could you imagine if we met on a Sunday and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Go to that again there. Pause if you have to. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Imagine if we gather together on a Sunday and each one, because be careful to notice the specificity here of the language. Each one. Imagine each single person in church wanted to read a psalm, wanted to teach, wanted to have a revelation, wanted to speak in another language, wanted, uh, supernaturally that doesn't happen anymore, uh, wanted to, to interpret, in other words, someone who knew French or German could tell you what that person had said in French or German. Imagine everyone, now you know how many, even under lockdown, if we have only 50 people, imagine how long we would be here on a Sunday and how crazy the service would be if every last person wanted to do something. Paul says, no, all things are to be done for edification. Things were not being done decently and orderly. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40, it says this. Pause if you need to look it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40, Paul says, All things must be done properly and in an orderly way. So could you imagine the chaos here of a Sunday where I or whoever else has taken the service comes along and I don't know what to expect. Some people are going to want to read. Some people are going to want to speak. If we, were in, if we were in the fourth century and people could supernaturally speak in another language, in German or French or something, they'd want to get up and speak in that language even though they never learned it in school. And then someone else who did learn it in school could say, here's what they're saying. And then someone else wanted to give a teaching. We'd be here till two or three o'clock. Now, even nature itself would teach you that's not right. You know, it, people can maybe sit in church for about an hour. And even that's pushing it for some people for an hour. And I know I've been guilty of going over the hour and I'm, I'm always trying to, 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 to keep on time. But, you know, even nature itself would teach you that the way our minds are, are designed, you know, if we're in church for three hours, it, it's, 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 not going to, it's not going to work for us. Now, this has maybe changed. Go back 300 years ago and people would happily sit in church for two hours because they hadn't a whole lot else to do. And there was no television and their minds were different. They were able to pay attention for longer. But look, we can't help it because of television and the internet, we're not able to pay attention for more than an hour. It's not a good thing, but it's how we are. So even nature itself will teach us how we should do our services. Even nature itself will teach us that it's probably not a good idea to have a service at 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. Even nature itself will teach us it's probably not a good idea to have a two-hour service. Even nature itself would teach us that not everyone is fit to, 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 to stand up and, and give a teaching or something in church. Um, but yet in current, everyone wanted it. Could you imagine how unbearable that kind of service would be where each single person in church wanted to have their say? <laughs> no wonder Paul said that it was not good when they came together, but for the worse. If someone came into one of those services, they probably wouldn't come back. This is why in Ephesians chapter 4, look at Ephesians chapter 4. And if you look at verses 11 and 12 there, it says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So not everyone was an apostle back then. Not everyone was a prophet back then. Not everyone is an evangelist. You often hear people saying we're all evangelists. Scripture is clear, we're not all evangelists. We're all witnesses. But an evangelist is someone who's able to stand up and teach a coherent, clear gospel message. Our Sunday school teachers are evangelists because they have that gift of being able to put the gospel across. I am an evangelist because I'm, uh, God has given me the gift of being able to explain the gospel to you. You might not be an evangelist, but you, you're a witness. Every Christian's a witness because you can say what God has done in your life. Some are pastors and teachers. Not everyone has the gift to pastor and, and teach. And all these t things are to be done as God's word has said, but also as common sense and nature dictates in a properly and orderly way for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So there's three things that we're told in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12 from scripture that church should do. It should perfect the saints. 
it, it should involve the work of ministry. In other words, people uh, using the gifts that they've been given to minister to the body of Christ. Why? For the edifying of the body of Christ. So those are three things that the scripture says. Now, nature itself will teach us in our circumstances how that looks. So the Bible doesn't have very specific, right down to the last detail, instructions on how to perfect the saints. It doesn't have a, an exact kind of list of things that someone involved in the work of the ministry is to do. Uh, it, it doesn't say precisely what is to be done each Sunday or even during the week for the edifying of the body of Christ. It will look different from congregation to congregation. It will look different from denomination to denomination. It will look different from country to country. It will look different from culture to culture. Why? Because God has not only given us the Bible, he's given us nature itself. Just stop and go back again to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Pause there. And look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14. Does even nature itself not teach you? So we follow the scripture in how we worship and come together as a church and in how we live out our Christian lives. But we also don't ignore common sense and wisdom and what the world around us plainly shows us. What nature itself teaches us. So the worship of God and, and how the church is run and organised needs to be done properly and in an orderly way. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 40 says that and Paul had to say that because things in the church in Corinth were not being done properly and in, or, in an orderly way. Everyone wanted to do something in the service and it was chaotic. And he says no, properly and orderly in the light of nature. If we were to start, if I was very mistakenly as your minister to say Ephesians, uh, sorry, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 26 clearly teaches that everyone who comes to church is to do something. Uh, either have a, a, read a psalm or uh, ha have a teaching or whatever it is, the light of nature would tell us that that's wrong. Because what you would have is people would stop coming because they would come here at 12 and they'd still be here at 3 o'clock. <laughs> and they'd be looking at me going, when are you going to put an end to this? So the light of nature, common sense tells us, uh, directs us an awful lot. But under scripture, under scripture. So both how we worship, how the church is governed needs to be done properly. So for example, we have a church committee. Now, not everybody is on the church committee, but people who are elected because if if every single member of the church had to come every time the committee met, the meeting would go on for a very long time, as many people would have their say. Um, but it's better, and the Bible doesn't tell us that we have to do it this way, but common sense tells us that it's better off electing some people to speak on the behalf of others. Now the Bible does tell us that some are called to be elders, not all, so not everyone's an elder. And But when the session meets, for example, the light of nature would tell us that it is not a good idea to have a session meeting at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning because a lot of our elders would be in work. The Bible doesn't say. I could say as, as minister, we're having a session meeting at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning and the Bible doesn't say we can't. Well, it does. Does even nature itself not teach you that this is not a good idea because people are in work? So again, the Bible appeals to our common sense. It appeals to our common sense. Now, depending on our circumstances, that will be different. So again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, does even nature itself not teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? How long? How many inches? At what point is the man's hair a dishonor to him? At what length does it become a dishonor to him? The Bible doesn't say. Long hair in one culture might be not seen as long hair in another. And people, as we know, in, in those days had longer hair than we have now. Um, so what they might have seen as long hair might be different to what we see as long hair. But here was the point. Men were in the practice in the Greek world, in the Greek and Roman world, of growing their hair long so as to look like a woman. That was the point. And Paul was saying, no, a man is not a woman. And if a man is deliberately growing his hair and, and, and having it in the way a woman has it, that's, that's not right. It's, it's not how he, he's designed. It's not what he is. Nature itself would teach you that. 
So it would be, how would we see that in our day? Well, if a man, if a man went and maybe got his hair styled in a hairdresser, very obviously to be like a woman's hair, uh, that would be the, probably the equivalent that in our modern day. But different things are seen in different societies as, as, as you know, between what men do and what women do. Uh, so it's different from age to age and it's different from country to country even. But it's our perception of what nature teaches. It's, 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 it's what nature itself teaches. And this requires wisdom. So interpreting the light of nature and saying to ourselves, what does nature itself teach us? It requires common sense, first of all. Common sense would tell us not to have a session meeting at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. But it also requires wisdom. You know, um, how does 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to 16 apply now? Well, wisdom is required to figure that one out. Because what does nature itself teach us now? We understand a lot more about nature than we did then. That doesn't change what the Bible says. But it, it does change what we understand from nature. God didn't use the Bible to, to teach people about nature. He simply said, take a brief look at the world around you. Look at how the world works and figure out from that common sense what works and what doesn't. The worship of God and the government of the church need to be done properly and in an orderly way in the light of nature. And our confession of faith says this, Christian prudence, in other words, Christian wisdom, according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. So in following the light of nature, we don't contradict the scripture. So someone could say to me, would it not make sense really to have, okay, we are only allowed to meet together in groups of 50 when we're allowed to meet. So why not maybe have a service on a Saturday and a service on a Sunday? So you could have a service on a Saturday morning for those who can come on a Saturday morning and then have another one on a Sunday. Well, no, we're specifically told to meet together on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day, on the first day of the week, which in the new covenant is Sunday. So meeting on a Friday or a Saturday wouldn't be fulfilling that command. So it might seem like common sense, but it's not. Um, someone might say to me, uh, Maybe if you drew, if, if, say if I was good at art, I'm not, I couldn't draw a cat, but say if I was really good at art and say I was able to do lovely paintings really quickly, well, someone might say to me, would you not incorporate that into the service? Could you maybe not do a nice painting as, uh, as part of the service and say, look, here we see the beauty. Well, no, if God wanted us to do that, he would have said, this is what you do. He said, no, you use the word and the word preached is the way that we communicate God's word in the service. We can use other things as aids and helps to that, but the central thing is the word. Uh, people could say, well, look, what's the point in the expense of a building? What is the point in the expense of heating the building and having people travel a distance to come when they could just sit at home and watch a video like this and there's no need for them to come to church? Well, the scripture clearly says in both Old and New Testaments that we're to gather together physically, that just a video at home is no substitute. It's the best we have at the minute but it's no substitute. So we have to be careful in interpreting the light of nature that we use our common sense, but we don't do anything contrary to scripture, that we don't do what the scripture doesn't tell us to do, that we don't do things that clearly go against God's word. And this is the way religion can pan out. And we can see in, even in, in churches throughout the world, we can see that people have gone more with the light of nature and less with scripture. That they've gone maybe with what they see as common sense, but what they don't realise is that maybe some of the stuff they're doing is contrary to scripture. So yes, nature itself teaches us common sense. Nature itself teaches us that not only um, do, do we need to gather together uh, at a time of day that is kind of works for people, not 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday, but that it's good to have the building heated. That it's it's good in COVID times to have a separation between people. So COVID is a perfect example of what nature itself teaches us. In this day and age, nature itself teaches us that we need to be two metres apart in a worship service. Nature itself teaches us not to cram too many people in. Because nature itself teaches us that if you do that, 
you are very likely to pick up a, a deadly virus that could kill you or leave you in hospital or at the very least incapacitate you for a couple of weeks. So the light of nature teaches us things and we can see it in how we obey the COVID regulations. We're obeying not the scripture, but we're not going against the scripture. We're obeying what the light of nature teaches us itself. And that common sense and that godly wisdom are acquired. Otherwise, we could end up like the people in the book of Judges. Uh, the book of Judges, the, Israel in the time of the book of Judges is a bit like the church in Corinth. It was chaotic and there was all kinds of crazy things going on. And if you read chapter 21, I won't go into it now. If you read chapter 21 of Judges, there was all kinds of crazy things going on that were not good. And that's pretty much what goes on in the whole book of Judges. Uh, the book of Judges describes just how off the wall God's people had become in many respects. And it's all summed up with the final verse that says this. In those days, verse 25 of chapter one, 21 of Judges, if you want to pause, chapter 21 of the book of Judges, Old Testament. Uh, and verse 25 says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's a bit like the church in Corinth. Everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. Each one came to church thinking, in my eyes it's right that I should be doing this or doing that. Rather than doing things decently and in order. If you read the book of Judges, you can see that how the life of Israel was conducted was not properly and in order. It was each person doing what was right in his own eyes. Doing what's right in your own eyes is different to what nature itself teaches you. And it's different to what scripture teaches you. So God is calling us in our Christian lives to do three things. First of all, that we are to follow what the scripture says and we're not to go contrary to scripture. Secondly, we're to look at what nature itself teaches us. In other words, common sense and wisdom and go along with that insofar as it doesn't go against what the Bible says. But in deciding what nature itself teaches us, we're not to just go off on our own track and do our own thing. Or not to be like the people in the book of Judges where everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We're, we're to come together and, and think things through. That's why we have committees, Kirk sessions, presbyteries, where as a church we meet together and decide what's the best way to go about this. And maybe where circumstances change, we need to do things differently. So when COVID came, each person did not do what was right in his own eyes. No, the elders got together and looked at the, the, what made common sense, what nature itself taught us, and what we had learned from nature, the, the, the instruction we'd been given, according to the best scientific knowledge we had at the time. Now look, it might turn out in time that maybe we're, we were being overly cautious, it might turn out in time that we maybe weren't being cautious enough, who knows, because COVID is such a new thing. But as best we could, we went along with what nature itself taught us about how viruses spread. And we had our worship accordingly. Now that's a principle that's seen very easily and clearly with how we do worship in COVID. But it should apply to all our lives and to the whole life of the church. Follow the scripture. Apart from what scripture says, do what nature itself, common sense and wisdom teaches you. And thirdly, let's not have everyone just doing what's right in their own eyes. Because that just leads to chaos and disorder and not to things being done properly and decently and in order. Well, let me pray with you about those things. Lord God, we thank you for the light of nature. We thank you that it provides for us a basis to have common sense and wisdom. That where the scripture doesn't say something, where the scripture doesn't tell us specifically what to do, that with Christian wisdom and with good common sense, we can work out the best way to do things by talking with each other and figuring it out. And we thank you for the wisdom that you give us. Uh, we thank you for the wise decisions that have been made by committees and sessions and our presbytery and our general assembly down through the years and we pray that the light of nature would continue to show us uh, where the scripture is not clear what maybe is the best way to do things we thank you that we've been able to stay safe during covid by doing this and we thank you that insofar as we know that nobody has gotten that virus through attending our worship services uh, we thank you lord god that we are not told by the bible for simply each one to do what is right in his own eyes that uh, we are not given over to chaos and, and disorder, but the, that through the instructions of the Bible itself and through common sense and wisdom, uh, that we are told to do everything improperly and in order for the edification of the saints. 
so that we might be built up in our most holy faith and so that people might not be put off but that people might be able to sit and listen and and take things in and not be distracted uh, by stuff and not maybe have to sit for too long or too cold or too late at night but thanks for the wisdom and common sense you give us and continue to give us to do things decently and in order rather than just each person doing what is right in his own eyes we pray you would continue to teach us through your holy word that you would continue to give us wisdom and common sense that we might rightly interpret the light of nature and that in our christian lives that we might ask not what's right for me but what's right for the edification of the whole body of christ uh, we ask this in the name of jesus our savior and our king amen